who grew up here, and he's been visiting with many friends around, and that's fun for him and fun for us. Um, he's a retired editor. He called himself the mild manner reporter after <laughs> <laughs> Superman. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he lives in Rapid City now. He came back from after he went east to, to the, the D.C. area, and we're just tickled to death to have him back. And of course, most of you know he's going to talk about the Sturgis Armory and the city auditorium. And he was gracious enough when I called him and said, would you do a program on that? Sure, he said. And here it is. Thank you. All righty. Well, <laughs> happy high noon, everyone, I guess. Uh, just by way of further introduction, for some of you who uh, don't know me and for some of you whom, to whom I probably owe homework yet from the sixth grade, uh, and Mr. Sigmund uh, as well. I'm David Super. Uh, I'm a Sturgis kid. I grew up on Comanche Court, Mead Avenue. My parents, I had a stepdad, so our family's name is different in the community, but my mom and dad were Ed and Ann Kroll. My dad was a construction worker, worked largely out of Rapid City for different construction companies in Rapid City. But Sturgis was our hometown, and, and we lived here and grew up here. And my younger sister, Virginia Fitzpatrick, still lives in our family home. Uh, so she's the mayor of Comanche Court now, uh, <laughs> when she's not working at the courthouse uh, with her job. And she's raised her family here, uh, she and her husband, Norm. And uh, their twins both live and work here in the Sturgis area, and they're teachers in the Sturgis school system. So. Um, the, uh, our, I think anyway, even though I came here from Minneapolis when I was a little kid, um, why, uh, my roots here in this community are very, very deep. My roots also to this building are very, very deep because I, like a whole bunch of other gentlemen and maybe now some ladies here in this room, um, got or the I or the whatever, however it's soaked into us from Colonel Brown uh, about joining the National Guard. And, and I, I'll confess uh, and, and be honest with myself and everyone that I don't distinctly remember ever Colonel Brown saying to me, you know, come here, I, you know, have you thought about joining the National Guard? But every boy, every teenager my age in the mid-1960s certainly knew who Olive Sagan was, or Sagan. Mm -hmm. And that was as probably as significant a motivator to join the National Guard as Colonel Brown's uh, uh, wink is uh, uh, the opportunity to serve in the military with your hometown buddies or take your chances with the draft board. And for me, um, I made my choice. And it ended up into a 31-year career with the National Guard. Half of it served here in South Dakota and the other half in the Washington, D.C. area. So. But today we're going to talk about the Sturgis Armory or the Sturgis Auditorium. I'm going to use those two words interchangeably. Um, there's, you could spend the rest of the day arguing about uh, what would be the proper title for the structure. But to begin, I want to just set the stage for you here today with uh, some discussion of what Sturgis was like in 1935, 36, and 37 when the armory was being constructed. Sturgis had a population of about 3,000 then. The Great Depression was in full bloom all across the nation and really around the world. Uh, unemployment was generally spiked at about 25 percent nationwide. That's a lot of people out of work. No paycheck. Tough times. Uh, the Dust Bowl was blowing here as well. Uh, agriculture got thumped really hard during the Depression, as well as the industrial economy of the nation. Uh, 1937, there was the death of two prominent pioneers from Sturgis, Joseph Davenport and your great-grandfather, William Grahams, passed away in 1937. Certainly some, that's a, that would have been an important <coughs> social and business and historic milestone in the community. Uh, for those two events to have, ha to have happened. Uh, some other things. There were two fires at Fort Meade within 24 hours. The first fire destroyed a vehicle shed, the motor pool, if you would, uh, during a time when the Army at Fort Meade was just getting its 
first waves of motorized vehicles and getting ready to say goodbye to the horse, sniff, sniff, those cavalrymen who uh, were fondly attached to their horses. Uh, and one of the duplexes, uh, the officer quarter duplexes at the fort, had a serious fire in the house. Uh, uh, an infant was rescued out of the uh, upper floors of the house by two soldiers who responded. Uh, so that happened. Um, a football player from Black Hills Teachers College died a couple of hours after a game with Dakota Wesleyan. The guy took a bad hit and during a time when concussions and other issues weren't thought about or whatever. And the, this poor young man, 20 years old, from Alliance, Nebraska, uh, died as a result of playing in a football game. Uh, a rancher and a daughter were trapped in a blizzard uh, in their vehicle on their way home from Sturgis and uh, nearly froze to death. The rancher lost one of his hands and all the fingers on the other. Uh, the daughter came away a, a little more unscathed, but nonetheless uh, a measure of what wintertime in South Dakota was like and the hazards that the people of the 1930s faced as they were traveling back and forth between here and wherever else they might have lived out in the countryside. Um, Fort Meade had three different regimental commanders in a, in a span of three months. They said farewell to a guy who'd been there, the colonel who'd been there for a long, long time. His replacement arrived in town to great fanfare. He was a member of the uh, U.S. Olympic equestrian team. Uh, he was touted as the, the, the best horse rider in the U.S. Army for the mid-1930s. He gets here, gets settled in, two months, he's dead. He got sick, developed pneumonia, he's done. And so his replacement came here, and he's the fellow who helped to celebrate the dedication of the Army. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Uh, and then a final thing that is a, a reflection of the, and I got a lot of this information from the old copies, old copies of the Sturgis Tribune, and talking with uh, some people who are here in this room and other folks on the phone, but a measure of the political tenor of the time and what was going on, the Great Depression, FDR, a Democrat had gotten elected as president, uh, Stoltwork Republicans were here in, uh, in Sturgis, uh, not sure about all this government stuff and could it, did it have the magic to rescue uh, this community and the rest of the nation from the, the grips of the Depression. Dr. Woodburn, who was the president of Black Hills Teachers College at the time, in the spring of 1937, just as the armory is getting finished and they're getting ready to dedicate it, Dr. Woodburn's invited to come and be the speaker at the high school graduation. When I graduated here in 1965, a college president from I, Huron or someplace, uh, maybe it was General Beadle, anyway, he came and talked. So in those days, it was, it was uh, fitting that a college president would come and give the, uh, the commencement address for a high school. So Dr. Woodburn comes down from Spearfish, gives the speech, and according to the account in the newspaper, and Frank Hunn was the editor-publisher of the paper in those days, and I don't know much about Mr. Hunn or his politics or what have you, but uh, I'm guessing he probably wrote the story about the, the president coming to speak uh, for high school graduation. And uh, in the first couple paragraphs of the story, he says, well, Dr. Woodburn recited some statistics about the value of a high school education and the value of a college education, None of the usual stuff you're going to hear at a high school commencement address. And then, this is, these are Hun's words here, uh, as he got warmed up and he's into his speech, uh, the, the, in a news story, not an editorial, in, the, in a news story, why the reporter criticizes Dr. Woodburn as a speaker who came dangerously close to espousing socialism. Oh. <laughs> 1937, whatever. And uh, have times changed all that much? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another way to look at it. But the news gets better. It's not all gloom and doom. Harry P. Atwater, an attorney, is the mayor of the town. Uh, locals in Sturgis still believe that Fort Meade is a player. It's going to stay 
as an active duty Army installation indefinitely. Uh, and if you, in helping Bob Lee do research for his book on Fort Meade many, many years ago, I can remember reading in Washington, D.C., letters written by probably the Davenports and the Atwaters and other prominent citizens here in town to the War Department attesting to uh, the value of keeping the flag on the pole at Fort Meade. Good water, plenty of hay for the horses, huge maneuver area, a sympathetic community uh, that was behind the fort and what all it stood for and the like. Well, I, I got to give credit to the people of Sturgis for hanging on as long as they did uh, because the fort stayed, the flag stayed on the pole as an active army installation uh, until the starting years of World War II. But in the 30s, they were sending letters to Washington talking about it, keeping the flame alive so that Fort Meade would stay in business. Uh, President Roosevelt, with the help of Congress, launched the New Deal. And we've all studied what the New Deal involved, how much, what it meant to the nation, what it meant here in this town and across the state, and out in the farm and ranch country as well, because there were relief programs that they were a big, broad brush, a little something for everybody uh, is the way it worked out. Uh, eventually, the Works Progress Administration, which was the federal agency that funded and supervised the construction of the armory, employed eight and a half million people uh, over the course of about eight years. The peak employment was three and a half million, and if you add up everybody who had a WPA <coughs> job, it was eight and a half million. That's a lot of paychecks that went back into the small towns that were uh, for families that were on their butts, uh, as well as the communities and getting money back into the economy and, and getting things going again. In Sturgis alone, the WPA program paid for the construction of the high school. That was $120,000. The building stands and it's in service today. The post office, that was about a $40,000 project. Building still stands and it's in service. Different purpose, but it nonetheless still is in business here in the community today. Bear Butte Lake in the park, that was a WPA project. Um, it was, uh, you know, I took swimming lessons there after you could break the ice uh, <laughs> and, uh, in the mornings. And, uh, uh, and, and I can't, I've forgotten his first name now, but the swimming teacher for me was Merrick. Is it Jerry? Carol. 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 Yeah. We were all terrified. <laughs> And so we broke the ice and we got in the water and we tried to learn how to swim. There were, uh, the WPA paid for a lot of rural projects, uh, building roads, stock dams, other improvements uh, out in the countryside as well. And there was almost $60,000 spent on the Sturgis Armor as part of the construction. And the other good news that was going on here, 36 and 37, some workers were up in Boulder Canyon, and I'll, I'll admit that I didn't read the news story all that carefully. I'm going to guess probably around Rainbow Curve, digging a, a cesspool, a, a septic tank system for a house that was going to be built there, and they found some substantial nuggets of gold. That started another little mini gold rush here in the middle of the Depression. You know, if you couldn't get on building the armory or one of these other projects or whatever, well, let's get Grandpa's pan and go back up in the hills. There's still gold up there. And so the newspaper, the newspaper talked about this little mini gold rush that was going on uh, because of these guys up there digging a cesspool for, for a house. So here we are with our armory. It was one of 11 projects, armory projects, in South Dakota. There are armories built in Aberdeen, Brookings, Sioux Falls, Mitchell, Pier, Madison, Flandreau, Yankton, Edgemont, Watertown, and Sturgis. And it got launched when the Adjutant General of the South Dakota Guard went to Denver to a big meeting in 1935 where these projects were being discussed. He attends the meeting with a couple members of his staff and they get the approval to build the 11. And so that would have been good news in Sturgis to have uh, General Coffey, or he was Colonel Coffey, but he was the Adjutant General, uh, would have come back to, to uh, headquarters in Rapid City and made the announcement that, hey, we're going to get money to build 11 armories across the state, and Sturgis is one of those communities. 
Next slide, please. Okay. Who got recruited by this guy? Who was ever scolded by this guy? <laughs> Two hands for me. Uh, and so, uh, you know, a, a luminary in the community, certainly, and a, and a real fixture in the National Guard for all of the contributions that he made to the Guard. Starting as a young man, I mean, just kind of barely out of college, barely starting his teaching career, and uh, joins the Guard unit at the time in Deadwood, right? Is, is where he started his military career. And then when the engineer company came here to Sturgis, um, he came along with it. And he and Vernon Officer and Freeman Steele and a Captain Lawler, who I believe was an attorney up in the Lee Deadwood area, um, they were the, the management, the leadership management for the National Guard unit as it got established here into Sturgis. The, uh, the WPA, which built the armory and all these other smaller projects all across the nation, eventually spent or generated, put into the economy, $4.9 billion, with a B, billion dollars into the U.S. economy in the 1930s. That would have been a big jolt of money uh, and, and what it meant for recovering the economy and building these lasting structures that we see here in our town and elsewhere across the country. And sometimes the WPA gets confused with the PWA. Those were, those were parallel federal projects that were part of the New Deal. The WPA was largely hometown stuff where the federal government managed the project, managed the money, and did the work. The PWA provided money to the big construction companies of the nation to manage much, much larger projects like the Fort Peck Dam uh, up in Montana and other things like that that would employ maybe even thousands of them <coughs> and, and require the, the sophisticated management of, of a big construction company and the equipment and uh, all the technical parts and pieces that it would take to make something like that happen. So, here at home, it was WPA. Across the nation, with the big projects, the PWA. Next slide, please. So, construction starts largely, really, in 1936. And that's the, the cornerstone, or not the cornerstone, but if you look at the, the big archway in the front doors of the armory today, you see there that it's dated 1936. Work didn't get finished until 1937. But so 1936 would have been the busy year. And Bob Graham's grandfather, Harry Graham's, was the supervisor of the project. I was unable to find anything in the newspaper accounts here as to how many people were employed. But uh, from other accounts, I know that they made 35 cents an hour to work there. And in the late fall of 1936, um, there was another jolt of money that came in and there were some changes in policy from the, uh, the WPA that added more employees to the payroll because they wanted to get the building buttoned up before winter came in uh, the late summer, fall of 36 so they could work through the winter and get it all finished by 1937. So more men were hired for the project and uh, there also was a policy change. <coughs> they couldn't raise their pay. There wasn't enough money to give everybody a pay raise. They just allowed everybody to work more hours. And so uh, the, they, they added 11 more hours uh, onto everybody's uh, duty schedule, uh, 11 hours a month. And so 11 times 35, whatever that is, you know, it's another week's worth of groceries maybe. It would have been something that would have been important to the community. Uh, and to the families that were the recipients of uh, this kind of federal aid that got enacted right here in our town. And you can see the, the costs there. The newspaper accounts all pretty much settle on 51000 as the cost. Uh, but then the promotional stories that I read talk about the project being $60,000. And so Probably by the time you added in a supply of light bulbs and floor wax and coal for the boiler and whatever else it took, it, I'm going to guess that, you know, added up everything, it was 
closer to 60 than it was 51. But nonetheless, uh, a lot of money for the community. And you can see how the big chunk of it went to labor. And so that money, that, that's money that got turned over right away in the town, uh, buying groceries and whatever, you know, beer in the saloons and whatever else it took to keep the community going. By contrast, the new armory that the National Guard and the high school uses today, you see the dollar figures there. That armory finished in 79 and it cost nearly $600,000. Uh, and it was a cost-sharing project between the federal government and the school district. Whereas the armory that we know of downtown was cost-sharing between the federal government and the city of Sturgis. And you can go all across the nation and find National Guard armories that have been built in these waves of construction and find different funding formulas, community to community. Most often it's a city and the National Guard that are together and here in South Dakota, most often it's a city and a school district that cooperate in order to build uh, an armory. Uh, the little picture there of the history book, I've got the book here at the table, you're welcome to take a look. I made The book itself is very fragile, so I made a Xerox copy of the first chapter, uh, and it's uh, probably written by someone, if not from Sturgis, certainly somebody assigned to the battalion when they were in World War II in North Africa. And it recounts almost day to day what they did uh, over the course of several months as they were fighting across uh, North Africa. So, next slide. So the new armory is dedicated in the fall of, uh, of 1937. Uh, they started out with a luncheon. Just 75 people got invited. Now, I, probably those were the important people in town who got invited, plus all the dignitaries that showed up. This, after all, was a federally funded project, and uh, that guarantees that you're going to get bureaucrats to come and uh, participate in the ceremonies. Um, but the luncheon didn't have any program. That was in the middle of the World Series. So they got in, they brought in a radio and tuned it to the game. And everybody ate their lunch and listened to the Giants beat the Yankees in game four of what turned out to be a five-game series. Uh, the Yankees eventually won. But uh, that day, the Giants did. That's the only game they won uh, in the series. Uh, a big shot from Chicago. A, a federal bureaucrat from the WPA was the guest speaker that day, along with lots of other dignitaries uh, from the community. Mayor Atwater received the keys to the building, which by that time I'm sure had been duplicated many times over. And uh, Duke, you've got your keys yet, but you know, and General Mecklen, you've got yours. And Sergeant Major, you probably have a seat in the armory somewhere. That maybe. You just keep it. You, know, you never know when you're going to need it again. So, uh, anyway, next slide, Clint. The the program itself, you know, who better to deliver the invocation than Reverend Erskine? That man must have never slept. Uh, you you read the accounts of this community's history to see where he was, and I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember the name of the Catholic priest who was his his Columban. buddy. Columban. Come on, okay, those two fellas, uh, you know, were the, the spiritual uh, guideposts uh, of the community, in addition to being just public servants and, and involved in a lot of things. So Reverend Erskine does the invocation, the high school band plays. Um, you see, this is the, the commander, the third commander in, in three months at Fort Meade. And he got up and, and delivered some remarks and... Uh, for those of us who were guardsmen in this room, what do you imagine an active duty colonel is going to talk about in a brand new National Guard armory? Readiness. That's a word that gets lost on a lot of people who aren't affiliated directly with the National Guard. But he praised the Sturgis National Guard unit for being ready. And uh, the National Guard's history goes back almost 400 years and I think the very first guardsman who met in Boston in 1636 sat around and said, we're ready. And so all the years later, uh, it's still, and today, it's still talked about as part of the capability of the National Guard. The other people that are there, the Adjutant General is there, 
then Senator Francis, or uh, Representative Francis Case speaks. Francis Case went to high school in Sturgis. His father was a clergyman and uh, was a pastor of a local Protestant church here uh, when uh, Francis Case was high school age, and so he went to high school here. Um, and Theo, uh, Ted Werner, Dates was his nickname, was a Rapid Cityan, a Democrat, uh, who got voted out of office by Representative Case. Uh, they, they, they competed against each other in an election. Uh, but Warner would have been in Congress when the, some of the decisions were made for the New Deal and for the funding of the WPA programs and things like that. So it would have been appropriate for him to be uh, here to speak as well and be recognized. Uh, County Sheriff Schreckenhaus, am I saying that? Schreckenhaus. Schreckenhaus, okay. So he's a, and he's a guardsman as well. Either he or his brother uh, is in the National Guard uh, at the same time. And then planning board members, and I didn't list all of the names there. There are two prominent names that you see, but there were other planning board members, and they are the fellows that are credited with uh, securing the land and the other necessary local permissions and enthusiasm to build the armory. The American Legion Post owned the land where the armory is built, uh, and so there, there had to have been a real estate deal of some kind or another done in order to make that happen so that the, the, uh, the builders of the army had clear title to the, to the land. And then everything finished up with a dance um, at, the, at the conclusion of the day. And the organizers of the dance, I'll, these are some prominent names from Sturgis history. Roy Sparks, Jarvis Davenport, John Early, John Keller, and Fred Christensen. So names uh, certainly that some of you here in the room would have uh, would have known about. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Just again to flesh out the picture of what Sturgis life was like. City budget, 25,000. 18 from taxes, 7 from the liquor store. What's the ratio today? <laughs> and would the city ever give up the liquor store? <laughs> well, not without a fight, I don't imagine. Uh, and, and there were discussions back then, not necessarily right at this time period, over the, the wisdom of uh, hiring a city manager. So that's not a new debate in this town. Um, and other, other issues like that that keep getting, keep getting uh, revisited as the community evolves. The school was almost 700 students, 270 were in the high school, and about, I think, the, if, I don't have the number written down here, but about 130 of those came from outside of the Mead County School, or the, the Mead local, the Sturgis School District. So the country kids, uh, and a good many of you probably in the room here were country kids who came to, came to town for high school. Uh, again, that's not a new thing as well uh, for the community. So that was the, the makeup. Uh, and as I said earlier, Jarvis Davenport passed away in the fall of 37 just uh, about a week after the armory was de dedicated, and William Graham Sr., the founder of the Graham's uh, family here and, and all of the big footprint that they have left on, on the foundation of Sturgis and Meade County, uh, had passed away in the spring of that year. Next slide. So the armory itself, these are the members, these are the guardsmen <coughs> that fell in on the drill floor, the brand new polished floor, for that first year of training inside the armory. Uh, and this is just half of them. Uh, the armory <coughs> itself um, was a new home for them. It allowed them to get out of drilling in the rented building that is today Bob Davis's frame shop, the back part of the, where the Haley grocery store and Army Surplus, when I was a kid, that was still the Haley's Grocery Store. Uh, that was where the National Guard held their meetings uh, prior to the completion of the new armory. And in the basement of the new armory, next slide, you can just, this, is, this is the other the other half of the outfit here. Freeman Steele is the guy down on the lower left corner. He was the first sergeant. Um, and uh, just boys. Um, or, or, or kind of so it seems. And I was struck, if you look at old family pictures, one of the things that 
I can recognize sometimes when I'm looking at my family's members is I look at the jawline of people uh, and to see uh, resemblances. And, and I don't mean to embarrass you, Bob, but I'm going to here. Your Uncle Claire is here. And that's, uh, I, I can see that you're a nephew. Uh, <laughs> as part of uh, how all that works. And, and maybe there's some other uh, of the men who are here today who have relatives uh, or somehow were affiliated with some of these uh, pioneers from the 1930s who were in the National Guard at that time. Um, now these guys go on to get mobilized for duty in World War II and you know, the, as the song of that era went, you know, goodbye dear, I'll be back in a year. Well, that was stretched for the duration and so uh, those men that left here in 1940 and, and into 41, it, the hundred percent of the National Guard got called to active duty for World War II and it didn't all happen on one day. Uh, the active army didn't have enough beds and toilets and coffee cups to take that many people onto active duty immediately. So the Guard units were incrementally introduced into the active duty establishment over the course of, of uh, 1940 and 1941. And with the idea that it would be a year. And well, it lasted a little longer than that. Yeah. Next slide, please. Another mobilization in 1950. Uh, I see at least one gentleman here today who's in this picture. And um, so, uh, and those of you that are, uh, that are and another gentleman and, and others here in the room and still here in town that, are, uh, that were part of this activation, uh, training duty first in North Carolina and then a year's worth of service in Germany um, as an engineer unit uh, at that time. And now, since then, I've lost track of how many times the National Guard unit in Sturgis has been called to active duty, either the entire unit, the whole flag, and all of its men and women go, or incrementally there are people from the community that uh, are called to duty for service in Iraq or Afghanistan, elsewhere in the active duty establishment. Next slide, please. By the 1950s, uh, you can see uh, some more luminaries here from Sturge. Sergeant Major, you're in this picture. Do you recognize yourself? Okay, all right. Holding machine gun. Well, yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and Mel Hendrickson on the left. Uh, when my sister joined the Army in 1963, Mr. Hendrickson, because that's how we knew him, came across the street and uh, swore the oath of office to my sister when she joined the Army in 63 to become an Army nurse. She had to be sworn in before she could report for duty, and uh, any active or retired Army officer could perform that function. So uh, Mr. Hendrickson came over to our house. That was a big deal at our house the day that uh, Mary Ann joined the Army. So. Uh, the National Guard in the post-World War II era, era, training in the armory, uh, General Meckling reflected uh, for me that in 1947 when he joined, uh, as the National Guard was rebuilding itself, uh, you brought a broom from home uh, so you could train with the manual of arms uh, because the local unit didn't have rifles yet. And so. Uh, and that's kind of the, that's the story of the National Guard, if you go deep, deep, deep into its history, of making do, uh, getting the job done, and as I said earlier, being ready. And so that's uh, another important part of the story. I don't have the first name for the fellow in the middle of the picture whose last name is Kenny. And I'd welcome from the floor anyone who might suggest who that would be. Um, Jim Kenny. Is it Jim? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Alrighty, and and do I have the name of Hale, not Dale, but Hale, Gearhart, second from the right, the guy with the helmet on. And oh, I've got a better picture of that. Uh, is Wally Hale in the picture? Yeah. No, I don't think okay. so. I don't, but, but Gearhart's first name wasn't Hale. But it I wasn't, wasn't, okay. It's was Gaylord. 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 Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay, alright. So. Uh, I knew I could crowdsource some more uh, information from, from the 
the group here. Okay, next slide. Now, obviously the National Guard's the important tenant in the Army uh, then and today. But the Armory, most certainly, and I would say on an equal and maybe even tipping the balance uh, measurement, the Armory is, a, is the city's building. It's the meeting place for all manner of things, including high school athletics. And so this is a picture from the final season that got play, uh, uh, high school basketball that was played in the downtown Armory. Uh, and that would have been the 58th season. And I had the, the, the good fortune of being able to talk with Lloyd Kessler and Bruce Grunwald. And both of those gentlemen provided me with a lot of kind of hometown teenage boy uh, recollections of what the armory meant to them and how it all worked and how important it was to their lives as a place to not only practice basketball but play basketball. Uh, there was a, a generous um, but capable janitor who managed the building in those days. And we only know that his first name is Ernie, and so we welcome help with his last name from anyone who can remember. He was a very short man and kind of stout, but uh, he nonetheless was the keeper of the key uh, for letting people in and out of the Army, including kids who would come down and be allowed to play basketball on the floor uh, when the Armory wasn't used for something else. And, uh, and he, he ruled the building as well and had the respect of the students. And if you misbehaved, uh, you'd get banished from the Armory for a week, two weeks, and he kept book on kids somehow or another, either in his head or, or whatever, and when you'd show up and your sentence hadn't been fully served yet, you know, he said, no, sir, you can't come in. You know, you, I told you not to do whatever, whatever, and you, you disobeyed me, and so uh, next week you get to come back in. So Sturgis was basketball champs also in 1947. Yes, yeah, and while well, there was powerhouse basketball teams uh, through those years, uh, going to the state tournament several times and didn't get whipped by Rapid City every time, like when I was in high school. And so. Ernie Hampton. Ernie Hampton? Okay. Thank you. I'll, write, I'll put that down. Bruce Grunwald provided me with a, a recollection from his freshman year in high school. Uh, and he was in the class of 50. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, that LG Coacher, who was an attorney here in town, had somehow had connections to the commissary at Ellsworth, or what would then have been Rapid City Air Base. And in 1945, the war's over, but the local economy and the consumer goods and things like that are just starting to kind of come back into uh, uh, public use and whatever. And LG Kocher uh, tapped into a source of candy and gum. <laughs> and what brought cases of it to town and then recruited four or five high school boys who wore like cigarette girls in a Las Vegas night, <laughs> these boxes with a ribbon around. And I can see Bruce Grunwald uh, doing this. Uh, he was a teacher in the high school when I was a sophomore for one year. They had an emergency vacancy and needed an English teacher. Bruce had just gotten out of the Navy and uh, he filled in for a year. It made a big impression on us kids. And, uh, and I've talked to him on the phone now, and we've traded emails over the course of the last, I don't know, 10 years probably. And uh, it's just reinforced in my mind what a showman he was. Uh, and I can see him with Hershey bars and Wrigley's gum uh, that was kind of new for the local consumer economy at the time. And he said they made a lot of money. And uh, that was the freshman class. And that money went into the class treasury. Uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Kocher's connections, however that worked out <laughs> <laughs> at the air base. LG's son, Bill, was the lawyer. Yes. Yeah. LG was a teacher at high school. Oh, is that what? Okay. Yeah. So LG was a teacher. Ah, okay. So that would have been the, 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 the connection. Okay. And, uh, and, and Bruce also told me about uh, 
in when he would have been in high school, the Lions Club, the Rotary, one of the service clubs here in town had a uh, variety show in the armory and Bruce was there with, with his magic tricks. <laughs> and uh, Bruce uh, today, if you follow him on Facebook, is still every bit the magician and uh, sings praises of uh, uh, magicians and their skills and, and his, I think probably now, kind of wistful uh, thinking that oh, if I could just get on stage one more time, I can, you know, I can I can still saw a lady in half, you know, or, or whatever it is that uh, he was good at with uh, uh, with his magic tricks. And Lloyd Kessler talked to me about what a good place for basketball the armory was. <coughs> Had high ceilings, good lights. It was a a full size regulation court. And so the strategy of the Sturgis kids that played basketball there, who practiced there, was different. And it, and it threw the other teams that would come here from their little piddly squat gyms in Deadwood or wherever else they were playing on a shorter, narrower court. They'd come here and play on the big floor. And the Sturgis kids would have an advantage uh, with them uh, in the way that the game was executed. And of course, Bill Woodle was the coach in those days. And so, yeah, he just, you know, in his pocket, he had that day's magic. And what was his nickname? That we can say in public yet? In, in, or whatever. I, I have heard it, it, that he was called the Fox. Was that the polite nickname that was, that was, was used for him because of, of his ability to rescue a game in the last quarter or whatever with some trick play or some strategy that the other team and coach hadn't thought of. And, uh, he, and he would be there to work his magic uh, and lead the scoopers on to victory. So uh, thanks to Lloyd and, and Bruce for their recollections from high school. Um, so Clint, one next slide, please. This is a partial list of how the community would be involved in the armory. Yep. Obviously, the, the, when the, particularly when the guard first or the armory first opened, uh, the veterans groups met in the armory as well. Uh, the Legion and the, and the VFW and whatever else that would have been the uh, World War One veterans, the 48th and, and others that probably would have been holding meetings there. Uh, the Red Cross chapter uh, with Mrs. Blanche Hardy, and that's a name that's lost on me. I don't know who she was, but she apparently was the local director, the, the official for the Red Cross chapter. Uh, and then Mrs. Atwater was the librarian when the city library was operated out of the armory. Uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, my sisters participated in Girl Scouts uh, through the armory <coughs> as well. Uh, I only remember one Boy Scout activity there, and that would have been in the early 60s with uh, the exposition that was held when the new Boy Scout Troop 11 was created in Sturgis by uh, Jolly Cronin and Louis Cheney and Francis Langan, the dads of my contemporaries who created this new Boy Scout troop. And we participated in the Black Hills Exposition and we won the presidential award that year. It was a big deal for us skinny little kids in the uh, Boy Scout troop. So. They have their Pinebox Derby in there now. Oh, they still do the Pinewood Derby? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's good to know. <laughs> they still use it. Yeah, because the, 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 the noise of a Pinewood Derby has to be held in a building at least that big or bigger so that you don't cause hearing damage to uh, <laughs> the parents and the other people. But, uh, boxing matches. I voted for the first time in that building. Um, of course, motorcycle rally registration. Uh, in that in that structure, the food pantry, and Dodie, the cooking school. <laughs> How many years uh, did that go on? A, a good long while, anyway. Yeah. So commercial enterprises would rent the hall as well as uh, civic organizations, youth groups, and the like. Next slide. Just a, a little historical folding up of things here. The National Guard Bureau, which is the headquarters of the National Guard in Washington, D.C., operates its armories 
with a ideal 50-year management cycle. So if the new high school or the, the high school or the National Guard Armory out at the high school today was finished up in 79, what's 50 plus that? Um, you know, that's, will this become, will the armory that's downtown be the old, old armory, and then there'll be the old armory, and then there'll be the new armory built somewhere. Now, that 50-year cycle doesn't always hold true for a variety of reasons, almost all of them are connected to money, um, but uh, that's the goal, is to replace an armory every 50 years for a variety of different reasons. The buildings wear out, the military changes. Uh, when I joined the National Guard in 1966, we didn't need a women's bathroom. And, well, that's the reality of the 21st century. Uh, just one tiny little example. Uh, when I joined the National Guard in 1966, you could drive a Jeep onto the floor, if you were careful, I suppose, and it didn't have any leaky spots underneath it. Um, or an automobile could be driven in uh, onto the floor of the Army. Uh, the Army's Bradley fighting vehicle weighs 37 tons. Just wow. one of them. Uh, you, you're not going to be driving one of those uh, onto the floor of the old Armory. Uh, and the new Armories that are built these days uh, have double reinforced floors and things like that to accommodate the heavy equipment. Security is a big issue. Uh, for armories these days, for the, for the equipment, particularly the weapons that are stored there. There's a, it could take a whole other day and there's people way smarter than me here in the room that could talk about that and just what it takes to make a new, a modern National Guard Army function for the National Guard. And oh, incidentally, it's a good public, uh, a public building as well because there's men's and women's toilets now. And, uh, and an extra strong floor. So if you wanted to have an ag show and roll in a new combine, wow. here, let's open the door. You know, and, and the floor can handle it kind of thing. So times have changed, and that's just how things go. Um, there's about 3,000 armories nationwide. South Dakota has 33 in service right now. At the peak, there were 45 armories in service. And you see at the bottom of the slide there, I've listed just some of the communities, these are Black Hills area communities, that have old armories that are still serving the public one way or another. And the top picture, the little fuzzy black and white picture, that's the armory up in Lee, which I think today does uh, daycare and other public functions in Lee. The armory in Deadwood, which is pretty much built from the same blueprint, kind of goes begging these days. The city of Deadwood's struggling with what to do with the armory. It's expensive to keep it maintained. Uh, they had great dreams for it about 20 years ago when the guard left town, and not all of those came to fruition, or at least not yet. So uh, who knows what will happen. And as an example of what goes on elsewhere in the nation, the color photo down in the lower right corner, that is an armory. It's called the Cranston Street Armory in Providence, Rhode Island. It's five stories tall. The drill floor inside is 600 feet wide. An entire regiment, a thousand men, could train in that armory. It was built in the early part of the 20th century. The National Guard finally moved out in the early 90s. And it is an enormous white elephant for the community of Providence, Rhode Island, and of its state. How do you keep a roof fixed on a, on a beautiful building? Just a, a, it's a showpiece architecturally, um, but a money pit like no other. And so that's an example of uh, what can happen. I don't think here at Sturgis, uh, folks are far too practical, uh, and the need is too great to let something like the downtown armory just become a white elephant. Uh, it, the, the building's too valuable uh, and, and needs to be in service, and I would guess would stay in service for a very, very long while beyond today. Uh, for those of you that have traveled to New York City, there's another, I don't have a picture of it, there's another National Guard Armory on Park Avenue, just right in the middle of Central Park, on the border of, of uh, Central Park, takes up an entire city block. It was designed for a thousand soldiers to operate from. The National Guard still operates out of a little tiny bit of it. 
but architecturally another masterpiece like the Providence Rhode Island Armory, but in a much better neighborhood. And so that armory stays in use in management by the New York Armory Board and uh, rented out for all manner of public events um, from its beginning, really, uh, in the 1800s when it was first built. Uh, and so it, it's possible with enough money and enough careful attention and stewardship of the property uh, to keep these buildings going on for who knows uh, how much longer. So, one more slide. So what's next? And that's a question I can't answer. And maybe some of you in the room here have got ideas, recommendations, suggestions, what have you. I know for myself that when I come into town um, and, and reach the intersection of Junction and Main, and I just, I just reflex, I look over, and yep, it's still there. And it just makes me feel good, you know? It just, that, the, the, my town is still here. And a lot of us here in this room can get sentimental and we could probably start a bar fight in here about uh, our attitudes and viewpoints of how, what Sturgis is like today and how the community has changed and what it was like in the 1930s and what it's going to be like in another 30 or 40 years. And I would certainly hope that an institution like the Armory and other uh, these bedrock things that are these benchmarks that are here in the town uh, will endure and that they, they'll have the capacity to somehow appropriately, and I'm, I'm preaching now, absorb the changes to the community. Uh, the, the rally is too big, uh, too significant, too uh, invested in the community to say, ah, we want it like it was in 1968. Um, it's just we can't roll the clock back. Um, but the armory can help keep the clock or the calendar going uh, through the years and years and years as things click by. So I've talked until I'm about out of gas here, and the hour is nearly finished. Anyone here in the room have comments? Oh, yeah, reminder. I'm going to be repeating this program, uh, for those of you that just want to hear me again, uh, or uh, invite others for the Scoop of History program, which will be Sunday, April 23rd, that's the Sunday after Easter, and we're going to be doing it at the Armory. So if you want to walk through, and uh, I have a daughter who works in, in public history, she's uh, on the staff of a big museum in the Washington, D.C. area. And, um, and a military museum, uh, by the way. Uh, and we talk every now and then about how did she ever fall into that kind of profession? And, and she will tell me uh, that, well, Dad, when I was a little kid, you'd drag me out to Camp Rapid or into the Armory of Sturgis, and I just can't get the, the tobacco smoke and stale coffee and shoe polish out of my nose. <laughs> and so, that's why she works where she does today. So for those of you that want to join us on April 23rd, uh, I was in the armory just a, a couple of days ago, and I, do, I think if we would have gone in the corners, there would have been a little shoe polish and, and uh, lucky strike smoke and, uh, and some old coffee somewhere down in there. And certainly uh, the ghosts of Colonel Brown, Mr. Murphy, Ralph Murphy, and many, many, uh, hundreds, uh, maybe a couple of thousand men and now women who have served uh, in the National Guard in that armory and certainly the many thousands of citizens of Sturgis who have some way or another come into the armory for fun or uh, to enjoy it as, as a fortress. So thank you for listening. If you've got questions or anybody wants to make a comment from the floor, yes ma'am. I work for the city and I can tell you it's used almost daily. Okay, good. To this day. So, David, I, I just wanted to make a point. In, I think that in 97, we let the last contractor revamp and redo the armory and seal it up and so forth. And it was just a, probably a million dollars over what it cost to build it. Okay. okay. Uh, and, so time and, change. Yeah, well, and it's decisions like the one that you helped, Shepard, sir, and others here in the community 
that the, that kind of an investment has to be made. And the notion that we can put it off and we can put it off, uh, like I had in one of the slides there, the city council, there was a city councilman in 1930s, you know, we don't need to insure the building for the full value. We'll save a little money here. And then that would have been the, you know, two days before the fire. Yeah. So uh, that was, it, it takes that investment. I was just going to say that when, when Grandpa Harry uh, was in charge of the armory on that construction, 60,000, and then the next armory got built in conjunction with the Sturgis High School in 79, 500 and some thousand. Well, the South Dakota Army National Guard will break ground in a little over a year out at our regional airport in Rapid City on a new armory for the uh, uh, helicopter units out there uh, for 20 million. <laughs> I'm going to tell David a story of somebody who didn't play basketball or play in the band or be a cheerleader, but I was at every single game and I had to stand in line to get a seat, first of all. And then, after when the game was almost over, it was my job to run across to Wake's lunch and get a place for my friends. So I spent a lot of time in the armory, but I didn't uh, get rewarded for it, except I got a lot of friends. <laughs> your uh, Bruce Grunwald told me that essentially that story, so thank you for bringing that up. That, yeah, somebody would be designated as the booth holder uh, to go across the street and... Uh, <clears throat> I'm one of the ones here that uh, was in high school at the time of the uh, 1947 or 46 and 47 when Sturgis was taking the, the uh, honors all over. And there at that time was an outstanding group of athletes. And I think that almost anybody could have coached that, that bunch of guys into what they did because they had the ability to do it. And then I have a, <clears throat> there's a story about a little boy that uh, was growing up during the time that the armory was being built. And uh, it seemed like the, the uh, construction kind of dragged on and on and on and for a couple of years. And so they, there was a person that went around asking the kids at that time, what are you going to do when you grow up? And they asked this little boy what he was going to do, and he says, I'm going to work on the armory. <laughs> <laughs> well, when the new community center was built, they had quite a vote here was going to tear down the armory yeah. back in the early 1990s. Fortunately, they didn't. Mm. Anyone else? Okay. Good job. Good job. some things from home that you're welcome to take a look at as well. This is an, a uniform that a World War II vintage guardsman would have worn.